Welcome to this uh, seminar on managing financial stress and restructuring in higher education from Evershed's offices at One Wood Street in London, in the centre of the city. Um, I think before I start, um, I do share the views that have been put forward so far. We're, we're not at FE stage yet. Um, we're not. Uh, H institutions aren't at the same point on the decline curve as, as FE institutions, but nevertheless, the headwinds are definitely there. And I've been thinking for a number of years that they would be coming for, for a number of reasons, whether it's cost driven, whether it's competition, whether it's regulatory, they are there and, and they will only get worse. So my experience has, as Neil says, been, in, uh, been with uh, further education. It's starting to creep into higher education. The lenders in the sector are starting to put it even more under the microscope, and I'll, I'll touch on that at, at some point during uh, my, um, my five minutes. Um, I suppose what should HEIs be doing depends where they are on the decline curve. And by the decline curve, I mean from the, the, the top performers who are performing well to performers who are performing well but could do better to where the stress is becoming a little bit more acute further down the decline curve and, and in some cases right down at the bottom. And how you react depends where you are in, in that cycle. And the, the key takeaway is the higher you can get up that decline curve, the more options you've got, the more reactive you can be. And in the case that, that Chris cited, clearly there was a lot of time there and there was probably money available to do that solvent, uh, to execute that solvent wind down. But when a call comes into a lender on a Monday saying they can't pay the wages on the Friday, can you help? Clearly, that, that, there'll be a, a totally different story. So... Further up the decline curve, HE institutions will always be re-evaluating the business model. Um, current models uh, and, and the last few years have been around research, whether it's broad, broad research or niche or, or teaching focused. Newer models uh, have been emerging around uh, digital strategy, being an innovator or being corporate focused and really partnering um, with, with uh, key local employers, and Julie will no doubt talk about um, the, the role of the city and, and local uh, community and, uh, and the HEI. Um, I think further up the decline curve as well, investing for the future is, is, is so important, and, and putting, that, putting the customer first, customer value for money, investing in uh, the student experience, investing in the estates, investing in CRM. Um, you know, let, let the academics teach and let the support staff support and, and bring IT front and centre of what you are doing in your organisation. And, and why is that so important? I think as universities grow, the IT can grow organic, organically and, and can become a bit of a sprawl. And when you want to restructure, is your data clean, accurate, at your fingertips? And, and does it span the whole institution? And where it doesn't, it makes restructuring so much more difficult. Um, so we know the auger review is coming. What are we uh, helping some of, uh, some of our HE clients doing? Scenario modeling. So looking at uh, different student loan rules, differential pricing, how does, how does that change your, uh, your bottom line, line? How can you align your cost base accordingly? And again, it's all about data. If you don't have that clean, robust data, it makes that, that difficult. And when, I suppose, when the signs are becoming more acute, um, what, do you, what do we look at? We look at leveraging, we look at either, either income or cost. Income is not always in your control. It, it really isn't. So, yes, leveraging brand power and diversifying income streams. Julie may talk about some of the opportunities, so I won't steal her, th her thunder. And I'll deal with you know, the, the costs. So when it, when it is, when the going is tough, looking at the cost side of things. Um, so, again, have a, have a hypothesis. What do you think you can take out? Have a, um, do your own plan to start with. And what, what do you think the size of the prize might be? Test that hypothesis using external benchmarking data if you can get it. Bring in professional support if you can to, to assist with this. Looking at um, de-layering procurement, outsourcing, shared services. And depending on 
on whether you need to deliver instant cost reduction and, and cash and working capital improvement will determine whether you, you are in the stressed or the tactical or the, st the strategic um, levers that you're pulling. So, so short-term gains deliverable in, in, in a short-term time timetable might be things like um, deferral of creditors. It might be squeezing the debtors. It might be changing, um, changing policy around credit control. It might be putting instant um, procurement blockages in place. It might be tightening discretionary spend. Those medium-term cost reduction exercises, uh, those medium-term strategies might be around asset disposal. Um, it might be around rent negotiation on leases, um, procurement of services, renegotiating contracts. It could be around outsourcing versus in-house and, and that kind of analysis. And those are, they, they will take a few months to, to work through and a few months for the, for the cash impact to hit. So then moving on to, to longer term strategic um, plans, which may be 12 months out, um, around um, bigger asset disposals, carve outs of, of elements of the institution. Um, what are the critical success factors in any restructuring plan? Um, uh, at the very top, it's got to be leadership. Has the VC got hold of this? Have the finance team got hold of this? Is it, uh, is it live, lived and breathed, the, the cost reduction strategy, uh, the turnaround plan, uh, and the recovery plan? Is it embodied by the senior management team? And are the board on top, uh, on top of what's happening? Do you know the levers around income, around cost, around back office? Um, the, the third critical success factor is establishing the baseline with that data, knowing what, where you are right now and knowing then what your end goal is. Being pragmatic and, and understanding what, what is deliverable and not setting too optimistic timetable, a, a timetable, but nevertheless setting a timetable and having someone, ha having someone constantly on top of that. And where this tends to work is where an institution has a dedicated team and it doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands of people within the institution or tens of consultants pouring all over it. I mean, one or two, perhaps even one, dedicated project manager looking at this, delivering on it, reporting to the VC, reporting to the board, supported by two or three potentially external consultants who can do the diagnostics, who can work through and get the sleeves rolled up and do some of the implementation and sticking to that milestone plan. And, and that's when it really works. Um, you're looking at carve-outs uh, uh, with, with potential spin-offs. Again, what are, the, what are the key success factors there? It's, it's knowing what additional costs are needed when the parent leaves the child. Looking at the one-off costs of separation. And once you've done that, looking at what transitional services agreement might be in place. And again, coming back to the milestone plan, having a, a detailed milestone plan that someone can be held accountable for. Um, you know, coming back to all of this is, is management and milestones and, and living and breathing the, the restructuring. Um, I'll, I'll just touch on um, stakeholder support. Um, yes, the lenders to the sector have learnt from what's happening in FE. They, they are nervous about losing money now in FE. They weren't previously. Uh, but the area review, the, the, the restructuring fund that's being made available to support mergers uh, and what's coming out of that and the discussions that government is having with lenders is making them a bit more choosy where they put their money. So I think how do you keep control of a situation where there is stress and distress and how, are you, how can you be front-footed? It's by doing this work early. It's by doing that scenario modelling and having plans in place which you can tangibly demonstrate to your stakeholders and lenders are key stakeholders that you have control of the situation and you have a plan that you can execute and they will love you for it quite frankly what they what they hate is is uncertainty and last minute they like being brought into the loop with clear plans as, as, as soon as possible and that way you can you can retain as much control as possible of that stress situation area, uh, clusters, uh, collaborations, um, 
there's a lot of lessons been learned in government and in education circles about how to do this. But how could you imagine that being applied constructively um, in higher education? We, we, we've heard mention earlier on of uh, places like Bolton and others that are already working in what in other systems you would call consortiums or clusters. Um, do you think, how could you imagine uh, that being intelligently pursued in higher education? Well, let me, let me give some experience on, on what hasn't worked in FE around, around mergers and why some of them haven't got over the line. And I'll try and come back and answer that. And if I don't, pull me up on it, please. Um, the successful mergers in FE have been where you've had, typically where you've had two sides, two parties, and it doesn't, they don't necessarily have to be high-flying colleges, high-flying institutions, but you've had two sides working for the common good uh, with, with no egos, no empire building, both realising there is a job to do ultimately for the, for the protection of, of, uh, of learners and the safeguarding of their future education. The ones that haven't worked so well are where they've been almost forced, forced into it and there's been a bit of protection of, protectionism and empire building. So I think in, in HE, where those collaborative partnerships exist, continue to build on them and, and try and develop that, that relationship. The, the question I asked Chris was, I think when, when we saw, uh, when we worked at, uh, at Bolton, they, were, they already had that soft relationship there and, and it worked perfectly at Bolton because the, the guys are over the road from each other. Um, and they had that great relationship, but, the, but they, did want, they did want to make it contractual and they did, they did want... Um, both parties wanted greater certainty, control and clarity of the situation. So, yes, I think collaboration and partnerships and MOUs are, are a good starter, but I think as competition continues to evolve, I think it'll be all, all the more important to try and make those partnerships more, more legal. Can I just add, add to that, if I may? Because I, I think if you look at... Oh, sorry. Does this work? Uh, if you look at actually sort of what happened in the further education sector. If, if you look at David Willett's white paper in 2011, you're quite right, it's like quite a long time ago now. But at the same time, there, there was a, an Education Act passed, Education Act 2011, which actually gave further education college massive freedom. It actually, the, part of the reason for it, of course, was they wanted to take those institutions off the government's balance sheet so they were no longer public sector bodies for the purposes of the government's accounting. And they gave them all of these rights, all of these freedoms, in a way which they never gave to the higher education sector, even though the white paper said they planned to do the same sort of thing. And then if you look at actually what's happened since then in further education, the government and, and the funding council spent a lot of time chipping away at those powers, stopping them being able to, to actually do it, setting up the, the intervention process, the FE commissioner, these things called SPAs, as, uh, structure and prospects appraisals, all the sort of things to, 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 to actually stop institutions maybe doing things in a free and flexible way. Uh, even to the extent now, under this uh, 2017 Act, under which the governors are going to be personally liable for the institution uh, if, it, if it fails. So they, whilst they've done all of that in the fair education space, in higher education they haven't done any of it. So they, they've left it exactly as it was. So it hasn't actually changed at all. And actually, the funding has actually gone up. I mean, people, people overlook that. Significant increase in funding in higher education over the last few years. I mean, the 9,000, 9,250 against the income that, that institutions were getting before that are significantly less than that. So the, the funding pressures in higher education haven't been there. Now, the interesting question is, are they going to come into play? And we suspect they are. The government's come under pressure to, to drop those fees. Institutions are therefore going to, going to have to deal with that. So are we going to see a, a um, number of measures introduced in higher education which mirror exactly what has happened in further education? Because some of these mergers in further education are not planned, they're forced mergers. These area-based reviews were no more than the government's ability to come in and say, you'll merge with them, you'll do this, you'll, you'll do that. Are we going to see something similar in the HE space, as we did in Wales? You know, you only look at Wales, I mean, there were 13 institutions in Wales. Welsh government came in and said, we don't want 13 higher education institutions here. We only want eight. And if you don't agree who you're going to merge with, we'll, we'll force it on you. So uh, you could see something similar. And I, and I think it, what we've seen in, in further education is where they've been forced and almost last minute, dare I say, 
there's been a big dowry that's gone with it to support mm. restructuring costs, to right-size the bank debt, um, to, for professional support post-merger integration type stuff. And so when you look at uh, mergers in the HE sector, Where's the money going to come from? It, w I mean, money doesn't change hands in, in, in the FE sector. There is, a, there is usually, a, most times, a, a government um, incentive package, government funding package to support the merger, but there's no cash transaction from College A to College B for, for the assets. In, in HE, where you're dealing with much bigger assets, much bigger uh, budgets, but when you get to this distressed end, there isn't a, uh, there isn't a, a pot of money at the moment where there is with a restructuring fund in in further education to support those mergers so you could get a situation where you have a distressed university and it will take a lot of money to turn that around and where's that money going to come from and how how much appetite does the university up the road have to to take on that turnaround to right size the debt to, to restructure the staff base, the, the, the cost, and therefore does that, will that detract from uh, more mergers? And might you end up with a, some kind of wind down scenario, as Glyn said earlier, we don't know what that kind of looks like yet. Yeah. Okay, well we might find out whether or not George Osborne's 22 billion <laughs> investment funds are really out there <laughs> or not, uh, Neil. Indeed, thanks, Neil Latham again. Um, Universities generally, in particular, I think those who are smaller, more specialist institutions, such as mine at Bath Spa, are really worried about the, um, the, the lack of government policy and the potential outcomes, possibly unintended outcomes, of the Auger Review, mm -hmm. which could, um, for instance, in humanities, reduce fees without adequate top-up, whilst compensating universities that do science with higher fees, so they would be broadly balanced, uh, leaving some institutions uh, very much worse place than others. Now, whether that would be uh, an implicit policy for merger, we're not sure. Um, if that is a policy of government, or likely to be, it would be better, in my view, if it were explicit, as it was in FE, and then it could be managed effectively, rather than allowing institutions uh, to um, struggle and merge, mm -hmm. rather than control it. I have to say, by the way, that my own institution is has a strong balance sheet, we have good cash reserves, and we're not in that <laughs> position at all. But nevertheless, one can foresee a future where uh, th that might be a, uh, we might be in a very different scenario. And some of those scenarios aren't sustainable. That's the worry about government policy mm. that, I, that I have, and I expect others have, and the need, therefore, to think very carefully about how we approach restructuring. Mm -hmm. You. Yeah, I was just, I mean, you, you, you remind me, um, we did some work a few years ago for the FFSG on financial sustainability, and one of the things that we talked about was actually, when you think about sustainability of higher ed, financial sustainability is one aspect of it, an, yes. an, easily, an easy to measure aspect of it, but actually, you know, your point is, Sustainability is about academic sustainability. It's about social and civic sustainability, and it's mm -hmm. about economic as well. So yes. you need to get all of those things working in harmony in order to create a sustainable institution and a sustainable sector. Um, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, lots of stories about what mm. you know Olga is going to mm. uh, come up with and the impact on humanities versus the sciences. You know, we've heard of flaws on tariff as well. Um, and then you link that through to the sort of social responsibility of these institutions mm. with their charitable aims. Um, and you know, are we moving into an unintended consequences world? Where we're going to close the door on disadvantaged kids getting the opportunity to go to a great institution because actually we can't um, we can't acknowledge that a lower um, tariff uh, achievement is actually a fantastic achievement for them when compared to someone in a top private school um, with all of the support that they have. So you know I think there's quite a lot to think through in the next couple of months before yeah. Orga reports in order to make sure those unintended consequences don't uh, lead to a narrowing rather than an, an increased diversification of a sector which actually has, has, has made massive strides during a period of unprecedented change. When, when we talk about uh, mergers, I'm reminded that there have been some <coughs> discussions in the past in higher education, I'm thinking of uh, uh, University College London and the London School of Economics, which uh, you know, 
crashed on academic and governance uh, opposition. And it's a reminder that a lot of universities, um, as parts of the NHS used to have, have basically a divided leadership um, who, if they don't work together, the academics and the corporate mm -hmm. management, if they're not in stride, uh, that can be very disruptive. Um, Glenn, is that, uh, do those kinds of academic governance uh, uh, still have the capacity to block corporate change uh, effectively? I think that they, it might do. I mean, it, it, it comes back again to, to the, not only the legal form, but the legal structure that they operate. I mean, the governance structures can operate, obviously, at board level, senior management team level, and then at uh, student level, at, at the academic level. And actually, sometimes they're not linked between them. So you've got governing bodies in Oxford and Cambridge, you've got governing bodies of 30 to 40,000 people. So, you know, having a governing body of that sort of size is, is kind of difficult, isn't it? You know, where, whereas you have other institutions that have governing bodies of eight or nine people. But, but the question is, what is the linkage then between those who might want to drive that merger, which may not be within the institution. They could be the lenders. Mm -hmm. It could be third parties. So, you know, are they then going to drive the senior management team who may or may not be on the governing body? Because there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting mismatch. And part of the reason we're not very keen on, on our partners being on governing bodies is because they often act on the advice of the senior managers who themselves are not on those governing bodies. So they're giving advice to the governors who carry the can, but the, but the managers themselves are not part of that governance structure. So that's kind of different if you look at the corporate sector. You know, the, the uh, managing director or CEO of, sort of Shell and BP sits on the board at least. So, so it, it, that doesn't have to be the case mm. in higher education. And often, if you look at the constitution, they have the right, the vice chancellor has the right to actually sit on the governing body or not and can choose. And that's kind of a curious outcome, isn't it? So it, it's very, I'm not saying that the structures would actually stop it. And the, if you go back 10 years when there were a lot more mergers in the sector, the mergers were often driven by the senior managers, wasn't often driven at the governing body level. But interestingly enough, as soon as the heads of terms were signed, it was the chairs of the governing bodies that suddenly picked up, picked up the strings of this and actually started carrying forward a lot of, a lot of responsibilities. I mean, we use the word merge, of course, there's no, no such thing as a merge, is there? One, there's a, a stronger party and a weaker party, one party mm. takes over the other, and, that, and there's an imbalance. And, and often the big issue is people. It's all about people, life's about people. But I mean, who's going to have the rules? That becomes quite a, quite a key uh, factor. And a lot of the mergers have fallen over in further education, have fallen over because people cannot agree who's going to have what rules. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we should underestimate that, that personal element of it either. Thank you for joining us and thank our online viewers. And uh, we'd welcome comments and discussion afterwards. And please feel free to write in and tell us anything we've missed because that'll be the next programme. So uh, from all of us at Eversheds, with particular thank you to Glenn and his colleagues for uh, hosting us uh, and uh, providing the facilities today. And from Chris and Julie and James and all the participants who've come, uh, thank you very much and see you soon.